everybody um, to our panel debate. Um, good time to put your headphones on and hear us, then we, we will protect our voices. And you'll hear us so much better. Uh, welcome, my name is Nick Raskam. I'm known as the Data Governance Coach. And um, I am so pleased to moderate this session because as part of my job, I get asked loads and loads of questions. And I've been just running a two day training course the last two days where I got asked nothing but questions. So I'm really looking forward to be the one asking the questions of some very clever gentlemen here who are gonna share some valuable insights into data governance. So I will hand over to them to let them introduce themselves in turn because they will do it far better than me. So Tarek, do you want to start? Sure, absolutely. So hi, uh, my name is Tarek. I'm currently working for One Housing um, as the head of data and analytics. Been in the industry for about 18 years and I held nearly every single position in data apart from the chief data officer. So yeah, and yes, I am a sucker for pain. So I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague here. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Philip Miller. Um, I'm the CEO and co-founder at Solidatus. Uh, for the last four or five years I've been doing that, but before that, I was in financial services, so I spent a, a, a lifetime career there, and I guess I'm on day release now at this wonderful, um, this wonderful conference. Thank you, Phil. Uh, I'm Olivier Van Hoof, um, Customer Advisory Director at Calibra. Uh, I've been there a good six years now, um, and I um, typically work with, uh, with our global banks, really, and uh, help them on run the implementations. Thank you, excellent. So, this whole session, as you know, is the what, why, how, everything you want to know about data governance. So I prepared some questions, but we've left plenty of time for your own as well. So if I don't ask difficult enough questions, save them for the end and then we'll ask them anyway. So I thought we'd just start off with the really obvious question that people seem to miss, in, in my opinion. And I think I'm gonna pick on Philip <laughs> to say, why should an organization implement data governance? Well, why would they not? <laughs> I mean. I, if you don't, you're you're going to be in trouble at some point, and that, that's been proven time and time again. I don't think any one of us data geeks would have been. I don't know. We 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 to, to many um, to many aspects of, of our industry. Regulation, transparency, everything would be better if data governance had been baked in right at the beginning of a process. So the answer is, why wouldn't you? Someone's not gonna do data governance. They need to explain it to me, honestly. <laughs> Excellent. So I don't know if either of you two got anything you'd like to add to that. Uh, you don't have to, it's not no obligatory. I would just say that, you know, if an organization doesn't do data governance today, they will have to do it tomorrow, eventually, right? And it's always better to start early, as you, as you just mentioned. I start early because when you start early, it's a little bit easier. If you wait too long, you got long catch up to do. Do you know that saying, when's the best time to plant an oak tree? And they say 200 years ago. And somebody goes, when's the second best time to plant an oak tree? Kind of yesterday or today. And I think it's the, the same is true of data governance, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> kind of do you want to say something, Tara? Yeah, no, absolutely. So, you know, by not implementing data governance, you're keeping us in the job anyway. So if you want if you want to lose your data people and try to make some cost savings, so implement data governance. That's all I have to say about that. Thank you. <laughs> For that flippant remark, I'm going to ask you the next question, Tara. <laughs> so, you know, bearing in mind that Philip said, you know, why wouldn't you? But, you know, are there any circumstances where you think it is okay not to implement data governance? Yes, you know, the circumstances are that I'm on holiday or you're on holiday, um, outside of the business, anything like that is, is, you know, you don't really need data governance there. Um, Facebook, but yeah, so, <laughs> um, but in terms of, but in terms of, you know, it's a given, you know, you have to implement data governance, you know, it's, it's, it's bread and butter for a business. You know, if anyone says to you otherwise, whether they're a big business or a small one, that they don't need data governance, then you know, um, they will be subject to fines, subject to humiliation, subject to all sorts of stuff that they might be captured from. So it's the sort of thing that you would definitely want to consider if you're starting up a business, part of a business, or anything else. But you just have to remember, sometimes people don't want to hear the word data governance. So like with my speech, um, my speech yesterday, you know, you just start a fight club and you just don't talk about data governance. You talk about the things like people, process, technology. You, you lead them on that journey. And before, before you know it, you have implemented a data governance framework and they didn't even realize it. So that's it really. Um, I don't, anything to add? <laughs> no, no, happy to let Tarek speak with it. So no, I think that's really true. And I, I do love Tarek's fight club. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing data governance, but don't tell anybody, don't mention it. So, you know, I think so far, you know, perhaps it's been very, it's very been great and lighthearted, which I knew it would be, <laughs> would you agree? But, you know, we perhaps need to give people something, what are they going to go back and sell to their organizations? What kind of benefits have you seen organizations achieve from uh, implementing data governance? Should we start with you, Tarek? Yeah, sure. So the things I've just mentioned earlier in terms of the actual benefits that you would receive from implementing data governance is things like you're not going to be doing spreadsheet upon spreadsheet upon spreadsheet, you know, just to get a job done. You know, you'd be looking at these sorts of processes. You'd be looking at the people that are doing that, understanding, you know, as a data governance person, you would want to understand the impact of what they are doing in an organization and then afterwards bring that back in terms of a cost benefit analysis. When you look at, you know, as I keep saying from the beginning, you're looking at people, process, and technology. You know, the technology is the enabler of the automation of trying to do stuff. The process is something that, you know, as an organization you want to, you, you want to get down and, and try and, um, and trying to get right first time sort of thing, not to make it a laborious process, but something that can work with the business. But the key thing out of all of this is the people. So when you implement something like data governance and you want to see the benefit, by implementing data governance actually would truly make your, the people in the organization lives a lot easier and safeguarding them from um, scrutiny, safeguarding them from you know auditors and everything else because at the end of the day, we want to try and make it their lives easier so that they can do their job. And that's what the key benefits are from implementing um, data governance. It's not just a tick box exercise. It doesn't matter if you're from Dharma, sorry to say that, or, <laughs> or, ISO, or ISO 8000 or anything like that, yeah? Those are the principles. But to put the principles into practice, you need to have the people on board and you need to make it work within the organization. So th that is already a key benefit in order not only to save time, to save money and everything, you can actually pinpoint those things when you're taking spreadsheets out of the consideration, when you're automating processes, when you're making people's lives a lot more easier. And just remember, we never blame people when things go wrong. We blame the process. If somebody is doing something, they are trying to do their best in order to get their job right. So always look at the process. If they're circumvented the process, understand why, and then afterwards do what you need to do in order to make sure that not only they have an understanding, but then there is a process there in order to make things, um, things a lot better. Excellent, thank you. Lots of um, good ideas there, I was gonna say, but I'm sure you two have got other benefits. Cause, you know, but we're all a bit biased, let's, let's be honest. We think data governance is a great thing, but yeah, I'm sure you've got some other benefits you want well, to share. Uh, uh, one of the, w w a, a phrase that I really like is, rich people pay less. People with data governance in place muck up less. It's just a simple fact. And, and companies, therefore, with data governance in place will screw up less. It'll be cheaper to operate by doing something properly at the beginning. Get data governance in, do it right, do it once, never need to repeat that process, you're done. And everything will be cheaper. Speaking as someone who implemented, goodness knows how many data-rich computer systems over my career, the first thing that you do is you, you scope out a, a project. And that scoping process, without good understanding of your data, costs you a fortune. And actually, that investment, then, you get nine months into your data-rich project, and you look at it and go, you know what? <laughs> Doesn't look very easy, does it? Perhaps you wouldn't have started that if you had a better understanding of your data. Or perhaps you could have given the principles an idea of how much your organization was going to cost to operate if you had better data governance in place. So, so to, I, I guess my phrase of, of answering this is, good data governance costs less. Yeah, that's very true. Anything else, Tech? Yeah, I mean, I think just, I guess it's along the, <laughs> the same lines, right? But I remember uh, it was a McKinsey report a couple of years back, actually, and they kind of, you know, attempted to measure the amount of time people are spending, you know, trying to find data and understand data, right? Because that's when efficiency is really about getting, getting quick to the data, right? And I think it was 30, 40% of their time um, that analytical guys were spending, right? So if you put that in numbers, you know, it's, it's clear value, you can get it right mm -hmm. away. So I think that's a clear first benefit. Um, and I think al alongside that, I'm obviously within the banking sector, regulatory compliance is typically the first box they want to check, and that's the first benefit they realize as well, but that's just regulatory. Yeah, no, excellent. So hopefully giving you some food for thought. 
Okay, that's making you think about which of those would translate to your organizations. Now, I'm going to pick on Philip again because he was very flippant when I said, why should he do data governance? So hopefully, despite the, the you know, <laughs> our pert remarks, of it, we, we, you know, you do understand it is really, really important to do. But if an organization hasn't done it yet, Philip, how do they actually get started? Because you can't just have a magic wand and say, hooray, today we're doing data governance. And how do we get started? So a positive decision to start it is a good place to get started. Actually going all in, you, you can't just start a data governance project and decide to do it a little bit. You have to understand that it is a it is a recognition that you need to get to a certain goal. You, and we will talk about perhaps measuring how successful data governance processes are and projects are in due course, but actually, Getting started means actually doing it, getting getting something on the ground, getting it into the really into the ethos of every part of the data lifecycle. So, you know, lineage first is our maxim, but actually, what that really means is you're you're, you're getting an understanding of how your data is moving, and building into the lifecycle an understanding of how it's changing over time. Now. I don't think a data governance process can be successful by just painting a picture of what was at the time that you did the data governance piece. It has to, it has to be an animation. It has to change over time. So if you're not prepared to go all in with that, then it's almost, you know, I think someone used the phrase chocolate fire guard the other day. It's going to be like that. <laughs> so get it done, get it done properly. Use the right materials, the right tools, have the right approach and the right commitment to keeping it up to date. Now, flippancy aside, that's the only way to do it. It isn't a bobbins project. It's a project you have to get right. Yeah, and I'd probably even go as far as <coughs> say it's not a project, it's change management. Yeah, and I was just about to make that point as well. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. No, you're absolutely right. Spot on. You know, it's about, it's everyone's business when you bring in data governance in. Yeah, no matter when you start or how it is, it's what we said here. You know, you have to go all in. And that means, okay, from the top down, bottom up, however you want to do it, it is everybody's responsibility when it comes to data governance. It is not a, just because you might appoint a person saying that they're the head of data governance, data governance manager, so on and so forth. It is everybody's responsibility to make it a way of, you know, a way of working. Yeah, it's a, it is a culture shift, you know. You know, if you're trying to implement, uh, implement this, you could, you know, invite people like Nicola and stuff like that who can help you along, the, along those journey. You know, you will be therapists because you will be understanding people's businesses' problems. You'll be sitting there learning about that, learning about the processes, their pain points, what's really bugging them. We're all going to be therapists. But in order to do that, it's not a one man's journey. It's everyone's journey. And it is a way of working. Absolutely. Well put. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Oliver, have you got anything you want to add? Uh, I think I would just, yeah, definitely it's, it's about going going all in, right? Not just putting your feet in the water and, and kind of tasting it. You really have to kind of commit to, to data governance. And as we said, it's not a project or a program. It, it quickly goes into VAU and it's continuation, right? It's not something you do in six months and you're done. Um, so I think that that's really the key. And, and it's really about, you know, committing resources, financial, but also sea level, making sure you have that support. Um, so it's about having kind of the strategic view of where do we want to go in three years, combined with a kind of bit more tactical as well. You know, what can we do in three months? Because you know, if you're going to keep the project alive and the program alive in three, four months, you need to show value, right? Because if you don't show value, you're going to lose that commitment at some point. So I think yeah, that's, absolutely. That's the People are not going to wait three years exactly to get some benefit. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, very, very true. And I think you uh, totally unrehearsed, but he did a beautiful segue into the next question, <laughs> which is you're talking about the resources. And I think, you know, that's something that hopefully, if I was you, I'd be wondering, well, what resources do I need to set this up and get started? So, I don't know, um, Philip, do you want to start with that one? Well, I, I think the first thing to recognize is that what you're trying to do is give an organization its own innate intellectual property, its own understanding of itself. You're giving the organization an understanding how the organization is built. It's a blueprint, and that necessitates fact that you have to recognize at the beginning of the process that you've got an organization of little islands of information. So if we were an organization, everyone in this audience would be an SME on something. They're all going to have little bits of overlapping information. You're all going to be, you're all going to have a thing that you're good at. Institutionally, the organism of the company won't have that knowledge. So I can't go to you and find out something that's over there. What I really want is to create a repository 
that is useful in context, that's an aggregate of all of the information in people's heads, in their computer systems, in their databases, the context of how they operate, take it all the way through to the policy under which the, gov the governance of the, the company works. So if you're financial services, there's a tremendous amount of governance. If you're anybody these days that keeps private data, you're governed. So you've got to take everything in context. So the tools at the beginning are the people, the process, the data, the technology. But then what you want to end up with is a repository, an, an intellectual property repository that's useful in context. So not islands of people, but context-driven information aggregation, context-driven searching, context-driven um, awareness of your organization. That anybody here could ask a question to that repository and get an answer about any other process in the organization. Of course, that sounds like the Nirvana state, but that's really what you want. You, you, you want to connect all the dots of your organization up with all the dots of its context, all the dots of its people, and make it useful. So the tools are people, the tools are process, the tools are data, and the will to keep it all current. Excellent. Brilliant. Well, well said. Any, anything else? Uh, I'd say, you know, as an additional resource, what you really need to get a, a successful program really is, is kind of your, your kind of data champions, you know. There's a handful of, a handful of more, depending on the size, right? But of, of people who really understand data, but really understand the business as well, and understand the benefit of what we're doing. So you can actually, because it's a cultural change, right? You've got to be able to get that cultural change across the organization. That, that really takes you know, a drive, typically, from you know, those, those kind of data, data, data essentialists. Yeah, they're very true. Next, next, I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, as, 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 <laughs> as everyone has been saying, you know, it's about having this sort of thing in, in um, that place whereby you can look at people, other processes, and so on and so forth. But there's another element to that as well, is that it's able to tell a story about the company, yeah. And that story should be it should be that Nevada that when you know when you when you're going through various departments and everything else, everyone is part of that story. Everyone's part of that journey, yeah. And that's and that's where you want to get to as well. Is that in the you know in the 1970s, 1980, in the 1980s, all right. Most of our company, most of the companies that were in coexistence now, are in silo, and that's what we're trying to break with data governance. Is data governance will will allow that silo of data being broken? Yeah, it's not as as um <laughs> as my as my as as Swing was saying here. You know, it it's not about the little islands of data. You want to create a country of it. You know, as such, or a nation of data with your data leaders, <laughs> with your data ch um, champions, and so on and so forth. And uh, and this is where you know resource when it comes to resourcing this, yes, it does seem a bit daunting, and yes, it does seem like you know it, um, the cost is quite high in order to get this done, and it is going to take a journey, but the outputs from that is to, is you know in my opinion totally worth it. Mm, and uh, my personal opinion is if it costs you more to do data governance than you get back in benefit, you're doing it wrong. So so, <laughs> so perhaps just one thing to really emphasise is that everybody should feel the benefit in the organization of not only the output of the data governance, but they should feel the benefit of sharing, you know, sharing in the process. It should be beneficial for the organization. It isn't just data governance for data governance sake. It is to make the organization slicker, better, more trans, more, more controlled, more consistent, everything else. So in the context, everybody should, everybody's a winner, yeah. honestly. Excellent, so hopefully we're inspiring you. <laughs> but this is probably sounding big and scary because yeah, I'm sure you've all got loads and loads of data in your organization. So I'm going to pick on Oliver <laughs> and say, so does all data have to be governed? Well, um, that's, that's an interesting question, actually. And I've seen organizations, um, you know, try for this kind of holistic approach, right? And, they see, uh, and, and try to bring all the data into governance. And really, that's just a recipe for disaster. Uh, you can't realistically bring everything into governance from the get-go, right? As I mentioned earlier, you have strategic views, you have tactical views. And, and also, there are, you know, when you look at your data, there's different levels in there. There's, there's you know, data that's critical uh, and data not so much, right? So I've seen typically when you look at, again, you know, within the banking, they have the regulatory scope, right? What data, what part of my data falls under the regulatory scope? That's got to be like priority number one because you just have to, right? You have to bring that into mm -hmm. governance. Um, for those who don't have regulation, then the next thing is really what's business critical, right? What is actually impacting my decisions? You know, am I looking at transactional data, product data, the kind of stuff that's really key to how I run the business? 
that has to be governed as well, right? Um, and you might have a different level of kind of strength, you know, different level of controls, right? So the regulatory controls are defined, right? You have to have ownership, data quality, lineage, you know, it's quite, it's quite stringent. In your business critical data, you can define that, right? Typically, you're going to want ownership, um, you're going to want data quality as well because those are driving business decisions. And, and then you have kind of a final, which is kind of a everything else bucket, right? And, and of course, that's very high level. You can, you know, go down to more details. And then you really kind of prioritize within those kind of big data scope is, you know, what do I need to bring in first? Um, and typically, that is also linked to kind of use cases, right? You're going to look at the use cases. What use cases do you want to roll out? And aligned with that, you know, they'll need different data sets. So you will prioritize data sets for sure. Um, and that allows you also to get, you know, to get to first value a lot quicker than if you try to bring everything under under the roof because that becomes impossible. Um, and if you look at it, you know, there's a, a big chunk of data that doesn't need stringent data quality and all that stuff, right? So it makes sense, I think, to kind of se segregate, if you like, the data uh, so you can focus on what's more important. Yeah, that's great. I've got, I've got a client who's got a, we'll, we'll think about it later bucket of data because they don't think they're actively using it. And so why are we going to do data governance on that? We're just hanging over there for now and we'll get back to it. Uh, they, you've explained that really, really well. Excellent. So we were making the point earlier that, you know, basically if you're not doing data governance, rush back and do it now. But that might not be as easy as all that. So I wonder if you can explore, you know, not just the when should you do it, but what triggers could an organization use to help them get started in data governance? I don't know. So I, I, like to, I like to say about Solidatus, we're the product that's going to stop you going to jail. <laughs> okay, so that's a thing, though. That's a really, really big trigger to start doing something properly. Mm. If there's, if there's a, a set of data that's going to be that sort of data, you need to get it under control. If it's not in control, then you're going to go to jail. I mean, that's a thing, right? And there's lots of now, there's lots of regulation now around that sort of data that will either give you a massive fine, you know, privacy leaks we know are, 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 are scaring everybody. But goodness me, we, we, the, in, in the news right now, environmental, social, you know, ESG data, that's going to that's gonna be a big thing, your share price. So there are trigger points that will get people really interested and then you get the associated benefits against it. So if you get that sort of data under control, you're, you're going to drag along other things as well. And the key always is to prove value to people as you're doing it. So it's not just about, oh, I've now stopped you going to jail. It's like, but you can do all these extra things now that you couldn't do before. And that's the, that's the narrative that Tariq was talking about, right? So getting the narrative about the benefits of it, it's not just, are we going to stop going to jail? Yes, that's the number one priority. Now you'll be my champion forever because you're not going to jail. So let's capitalize on that and, and make and make more headway. Excellent. Any other ideas from <laughs> Excellent. So we're kind of, you know, we've been making it sound like, you know, you must do it, there's all these benefits, it's all wonderful, but let's be a little bit more realistic. It's not always that easy to do data governance. So what would you advise people to avoid? doing if, when they're just starting to implement data governance? I mean, I think perhaps you should all come up with something for that one, but let's start with, so I don't know, do you want to start down the line? And sure, <laughs> well, I, I, think, I think, I guess, you know, continuing what I mentioned earlier, you know, you, you want to avoid trying to boil the ocean from, from the get-go, right? Like I said, that's, that's just a recipe for disaster. You, gotta, you have to be able to kind of view a kind of a tactical process where you build out your use cases and you build up on your program, right? Rather than doing it really from, uh, from the start where it's just, gonna, you're never going to get to first value. No, that's good. I'm yeah, going to beat the drum of not, so I along the lines of not you know, biting off the elephant in one bite or you know, boiling the ocean, if you're going to do something, you don't do a half job on it. Like if there's nothing that's going to damage data more than doing it badly. And so doing, a, doing a, a complete job and then not forgetting that you need to keep doing that job. So the, the mistakes are, oh, you know, I've done it, yay. <laughs> paper exercise, tick, then you're called on it two years later by the regulator. It's like, ah, uh, yeah, no, hang on, just give me, give, me, give me two months. And it's also, I guess, to understand that data projects are, they're not projects, right? We, we start off with data projects. It's, it's actually an approach to how your organization needs to run. So if you're, if you're not going to ingrain it into the fabric of your organization, you're going to always be 
always be in a situation where you're going to be like starting a new data project. Yeah. Starting, it, honestly, it, data is an ongoing thing for you. It is, you know, it's, once it's started, it never stops. Mm -hmm. You're always dipping in and out of the data projects. Perfect. And anything you think people should avoid, Tarek? So, you know, is the, the things that it, you can't really avoid stuff with this one. And the reason I'm going to say say this, okay, to get high quality data or to understand your business or you know how every what I was saying from before from people, process, and technology, and embedding that as a ways of working, you know, it's, uh, it's what I call you know the double helix. You know, change and high quality data, you know, comes together. Yeah, you need you need both. You are ever you're ever evolving as the, as we keep saying. It is not something that is an exercise and you put it away. Yeah. So in terms of avoidance, avoid is you know as I said, we're going to be therapists here. It's <laughs> you know you are going to be you are going to be hitting um, various challenges that are where people are unwilling to change, and those are the ones that you need to tackle first because the ones that are unwilling to change are going to hamper you in terms of getting your Nevada because if people are not willing to change or they're stuck in their ways of working, then yes, you know it, high quality data cannot come. If you recognize that you need data governance, you recognize that you need to evolve it out and everything else, you know, it is the time for change. So then therefore, it's bringing those people along that journey and then understanding that, you know, change is coming and they, ha and they have to be willing to accept it with all those personalities of change, but that's something a different topic. Yeah. Data isn't the enemy, data is a partner. Absolutely. I like Absolutely. that, you should write that as a tagline. <laughs> Quick, someone get the domain, please. <laughs> So is it, we've only got like two minutes. So I want to ask Oliver a question because this is a question I get asked lots and I think he's got a better answer than me. <laughs> so I want to hear it and take notes. Um, you know, we, we're telling everybody that we can deliver benefits, but how can we actually measure what, what benefits we're delivering so that we can kind of go, da-da, look what we've done. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough question actually because I see, you know, large organizations who are quite mature in data governance, you know, and where mm -hmm. they are still struggling with the actual, you know, impact of how do I measure my success? Um, and I think, you know, different ways of doing it. I think, you know, what I find useful is when you, typically when you look at use cases, you know, what are the first use cases you want to implement and all that, it's important to kind of take a more business look at that use case. And what is that use case going to give me? You know, what is the value I'm going to get, right? So if I'm, for example, you know, implementing a, a, data, a data catalog and I'm making it very easy for people to find data, right? So people are going to save a lot of time finding data. So that, I can turn that into kind of a number, right? I can attach a number to that. You know, multiplied by the number of consultants who are looking for data, um, and that can be attached to the use case. So you can have use case number one is X million of dollars as the revenue that I'm actually getting. Uh, so when you actually start delivering uh, or implementing, then you can see what you're actually delivering in a value perspective. And if you do like a quarterly review every quarter, you sit around a table, you say, "What have we done in the last three months? We delivered these two use cases at X million dollars." That is actually almost ensuring your next round of funding as well, because you got to keep the governance going. But if you don't show first value, you're not going to get it. But if you show the, what we're making, you know, in, in terms of business money, then that's that's the way to go forward. I think. Perfect. Anything else to add from the bench? I mean, I, I got I got into this game because I just got so frustrated. I'm a technologist. I like building software, and it was just getting harder and harder. A, K, a KPI for me, honestly, is seeing things get easier. And I spent 10 years doing regulatory projects. One of the outputs of bad data is more regulation. So mm. another soft KPI is actually we're trusted more again to handle our data transparently and you know, under control. So there are softer KPIs as well. It's not just the millions of dollars. It's like my organization's given more license to operate. And, and for me, it's about finding that golden thread. Yeah, from source, you know, from process to an assessment, all the way through to that KPI, to that um, thing that you're delivering from the business cases, from the use cases, it's showing that golden thread, because ev because behind every successful KPI that's there, or anything that's uh, that's determining that oh this is a, c a cause of concern, you know, comes under the data governance point, or come is the foundation for data governance, because if this is a cause of concern then more than likely the process is not working and more than likely the quality of their data is not there. So then therefore, you know, if, if that department or that person was able to turn it around, 
more than likely data governance will be playing a part of that and that you, you could just immediately show as value yeah so it's like although they're taking credit for a lot of things saying that oh i have saved this much i have raised my kpi this much you know as data governance people you can you can or data champions you can just take to, um take credit as well say that actually you got there because of us we are the foundation excellent well hopefully we've convinced you i don't know if we've got have any time for questions i don't know if they're looking at the back so probably not yes we have got time for questions anybody got questions um so we need a microphone <laughs> oh we've got the mic I, I i will run around then i now know what my next job is so let me put headphones on so i can hear the question can i borrow a so who wants to go there you go Thank you so much, and thanks, panel, for that. Um, I've got two set of questions. Obviously, Nicola did ask the first one, which is about how can you measure success to deliver data quality. My other question is about skills. So what would you say are the essentials and desirable skills for a data quality person or a data quality professional to deliver data, I'm sorry, data governance professional to deliver data governance successfully? <laughs> I guess I'll, I'll have a go at it. <laughs> um, I think I think really what I mentioned earlier, right, is, is you've got your kind of data champions, right, who who are close to the data, so that technically they understand data architecture and everything, but also very close to business, to understand the business, to understand the stakes, to understand why we're doing the governance, right. Um, so I think having a combination of those two skills, both business and data skills, I think is, is really key to drive it forward. Um, that's that's a high level. I think it's really important to have someone who's got skin in the game as well. It's actually, it, it, just doing data for data's sake isn't enough. The data isn't just there, it's got purpose. And someone who doesn't have skin in the game isn't going to be as interested to make it work. So the context debate, the, you know, the champion debate, it's not just I'm a champion of data, it's I'm a champion of what the data's doing. And, and so that is important, context is important. And there's all the other bits about detail and getting things right and sort of the mentality of check, check, check. You know, there's those things as well. So for me, the, um, in terms of a skill, of a skill set, the absolute, uh, the absolute one that they should be able to do is uh, able to tell the story of the data. Yeah, that's an absolute skill set that you know you need. If you're unable to tell the story of the data, then they would not understand everything that you're trying to do. So you know you might have skill sets to you know like SQL in order to interrogate the database. You might have you know you might have you know data scientists you know statistical skills, but if you're unable to tell the story of what you're trying to do, then you're going to fail in the first level because it's about influencing the you know the person that cares that you know no, who should be caring. If they don't have if you don't have that skill in order to say that why you should care and ring the alarm bells unless something has happened then you know i think that's one of the key skills in terms of like um in terms of like in able to translate and show everything to that person yeah i think that's really great but i think we've run out of time thank you so much for coming along and i hope you we've given you or not we them <laughs> they've given you some really useful tips and advice and good luck <laughs> go and carry on the fight of getting data governance out there everywhere so uh, thank you all very much, and um, yeah, hopefully we'll see you at other data events soon. Thank you.